there's a custom in Klai that when you have a yod site, the anniversary of the departure, the Ptira, of uh, someone for whom you are obligated to say Kaddish, usually a parent, not only a parent, but usually a parent, that mitzvahs are done in the name of the departed and accrue to the credit of the of the nifta of the departed soul. Li'ilui nishmas that it helps promote another level of elevation for that departed soul. This week, the I have yotzeit for my father, Zefren Lebracha. The Yorzeit comes out on Friday, which isn't the day that works to, to give a Shia. And for many years, we have tried to keep up giving a Shia for the Ilui Nishmas, my mother or my father. So this is the Ilui Nishmas of Ram Yitzchok ben Yaakov. This week's Pausha deals with the, amongst other things, with the breaking of the, of the tablets, the breaking of the luchos. The first tablets, the first luchos given to Moshe Rabbeinu was a, an extraordinary moment in the history of the world, the giving of the Seres Adibros, the ten tablets, and the level that Klai Yisrael reached during that transmission, that experience. Klai Yisrael attained to a level that harkened back to other Mauritian before the Chet, before he fell. Yet, not all of them were able to maintain that level. Some had a, a more limited hold on it, and others, though they didn't fail as much as the first group, which was a minority, yet they had a responsibility to, to corral them, to bring them in, to correct them, to which there was a failure. Only Shevet Levi was able to maintain an independence of the moment of the creating of the eagle, the creating of the, the golden calf. Hard to understand the, the whole Pasha, but we have little pieces here and there that, that we can get a certain level of, of insight and understanding. So let's see if we can put together some, some kind of an understanding here, a grasp. Call yourself that level that they reached at that moment still did not remove from them free will. They had free will, otherwise they couldn't have failed. Though it was a moment that the language of Chazal is they transcended the negativity of being animalistic in a body. Poskuzuomosom. They were elevated to them. But it wasn't a state that would last. It was short term for them to experience that. It was necessary to experience that. But it was within their free will how long and what level would continue for the future. We have Sukkim later on and that indicate that they were so overwhelmed by the experience that they in fact asked Moshe Rabbeinu, wanted of Moshe Rabbeinu, that he should continue the direct interaction with the Creator. It was 
too overwhelming for them. So on the one hand, there's a, there is an indication from Chazal that the Rebbeinu Shalom complimented them, that they had that intensity of appreciation of the quality of the moment. On the other hand, it opened the door for a, for a lowering of the quality, the intensity of their response. Moshe Rabbeinu, as a result of the fact that he does not come down exactly as they anticipated, the uh, chassidim make the uh, put the emphasis on the the fact that uh, Moshe Rabbeinu was, according to their clock, tardy in returning. And they misinterpreted the schedule, but they, according to there, he was, was not punctual. And therefore, they needed a substitute to interact between them because it's too overwhelming. So the interaction would be the, through this kind of a, of a medium that came about through, remember, the Mavoshim all remind us that the, they came out of Mitzrayim, they were serving idolatry. They were in a land that was saturated with idolatry. And they were now being weaned of that and purified from that, but it was, there was a residual kind of a, of a, of a sensitivity, a, a fallback that they would go back to that kind of an interaction to have something as a medium between them and the Rebbe Shlazim. And so they look at their clock, Moshe Rabbeinu is delayed, Aaron looks at this as the lesser of the evils. He's playing for time, he's biding time to try and, and see that, they, that maybe Moshe will come before the, it becomes dramatically the breach that it ultimately became. And see them say that because they were being too punctual, too exact in time, the correction for future generations would be that Jews undertook never to be exactly on time. So in case you're wondering about that, uh, the source of that custom. Claudia Sol fails, and Moshe Rabbeinu takes the initiative, the corrective, it's his initiative to break the first luchos, break the first tablets, and then we're going to have to get second tablets, and he has to go through a whole preparatory period to, to reconstruct getting the second tablets. Because I'll teach that there were differences primary differences between the first tablets and the second, the first luchos and the second luchos. The first luchos, Medrash is quoted that they were more fragile. They lent themselves to being broken if there wasn't the highest pitch and the highest level of spirituality. The second luchos, the Medrash says that the Rebani Shalom told Moshe Rabbeinu there's going to be a certain amount of compensation now. Now that you're removed from the high pitch, high tensile quality of the brilliance, the spiritual level of the first Luchos, you're not going to have that any longer. That was more fragile. You couldn't maintain that level, Claudia so, but now you're going to have a compensation, a certain amount of engagement now in the reconstruction of the relationship to the Rebbeinah Shlodim. How so? That the second locha says the Medrash will have in them now the methodology will be 
come forth with them, with the second Luchos, for Teresh Peh. Now you're going to have to reconstruct. In fact, Moshe Rabbeinu is told now, Psol Lecho, you now have to carve the second Lucho. The lettering, the lettering the Yal Sheikh says, is going to be the same lettering that was on the first Luchos. Because when the first Luchos, the first tablets were broken, the letters became disconnected. They were no longer anchored, rooted in that tablet, in those tablets, and they were flitting in the air, as it were, and they would reattach themselves to the second Luchos. The same lettering. In fact, says the al the broken Luchos would be kept in the Oron, in the Ark, where the new Luchos would be housed, but this, the broken Luchos are there too. And they're there to tell us that there's something about the broken Luchos that remains. It wasn't an event that happened. Okay, now it's for historians. It's an event that did something, affected, impacted the world, Klayaso, Jewish history, and world history. That there will be some kind of a relationship. Now, there had to be an oral law, a Torah Shabal Peh, in the first Luchas as well. But the first Luchas are likened, the Gedal Yashor spells this out very nicely, bringing the al -Sheikh. He says that it's like when you're inside and you've, you're connected to the foundation, let's say the roots of a tree. Let's say you're able to visit inside the tree like some cartoon that we've seen. And you see how the roots begin to take hold and move, branch out, reach out into the soil. So if you're at the source, you follow the roots from there. You have a certain perspective and vision of seeing from the source how they emanate, how they reach out, how they stretch out. If you're outside, it's a different kind of a perception. It's a different kind of a view. You're going to have to now piece together inductively with some kind of code and methodology and system to be able to reconstruct what, the, what it is inside, to reconnect. That's Teirah Shabal Peh. And Rabbi Yisrael Salanta says, father of the Musa movement, Rabbi Yisrael Salanta says that what is meant, partially what is meant, that the first Luchos were fragile because Teirah Peh, the oral law, how do we get a hold of it? We have to learn. We have to break our heads. We've talked a number of times about there's a wonderful program run by, founded by uh, Aisha Ter originally, but uh, I think it's independent today, I'm not sure. Inspire, it's called. Klayasol was then given Teresh Peh to perspire, for Yagiya, to work. Now we are, we now have to reconstruct and, but we're going to get to the same lettering. That is the way we're going to get to understand the written law, the Teresh Shabiksav. We can't get a handle on Teresh Shabiksav without this kind of an experience. With the Yagiyah, the investment, this Koach, now each individual, each one of us, originally, when Torah was given, the Medrash, Medrash in Yisrael, says that the Rebbe Nisham as it were, 
the creator, the master of the universe in giving the Torah, somehow addressed, there was a collective group, but somehow addressed each individual. The Tzibur, but the Yochid. The Tzibur and the Yochid were being somehow connected. And that's why the word Yisroel is an acronym for Yeshishim Ribui Oisius Latera. There are 600,000, just like those corn neshamas, and they correspond to the letters in the Torah, and already the Mephoshim talk about that, Reb Tzaddik and others, that some of the lettering that we have are combinations of a few letters. If you know how to unravel that riddle, then you could see the correspondence. So each individual Jew has his letter, and he has to bring that letter. But now, how is that going to happen? We are post Luchas Shnias Jews. We live in the world of the second tablets. And the second tablets, the code, the methodology to get there is going to be how? Through Teresh Peh, through Shosha Norich HaSaporah, through understanding Chazoka, Bailas, Macho, to be Meicha, to declare. All of this is inherent. It's in those roots of Teresh Abiksav. It was there in the first Luchas. And we could have gotten to them differently if we would have been standing inside by the roots, by the source. But now, that's history. But it had its impact. That impact is that the lettering then Psolacho, Moshe Rabbeinu is going to now have to carve the new tablets, but our access is going to be through, as the Medr says, the Halochas, the Agodas that are there in Teresh Peh, and we will have to go from the Prothim, from the details, the reasoning, the beauty of reconstructing and having the thrill, the intellectual excitement and titillation of understanding the svolas and piecing the pieces of the puzzle together inductively coming from the outside in. That will be, that will be our handle and our connection. Interesting discussion. The Meisha Feinstein, Zatzal, the Pesach of the door, the generation. Purim, he was Nifta. It was a Levaya in Chutzlot. It was a Levaya here. In, they brought him here to El I always found it very, very fascinating that. Moshe, Moshe Feinstein did not live in Eretz Yisrael. The Tzibur, that many years ago, decades ago, was not as large as it is today, our Tzibur. He was buried here on the hardest day in the year that there could be a Levaya, Shushan Purim. Couldn't be a more difficult day for people to come out to a Levaya. Because if it would be Yontif, they, they don't go. Yontif Cheney, okay, there are certain extraordinary circumstances, unique circumstances that there's a limited kind of a... But for a Tzibu to come out on a single day of the year, the hardest day of the year was Shushan Purim. And then, they estimated, then, decades ago, it was a quarter of a million people who came to the Levaya. It wasn't too long after that, there was a professor, head of the depart Judaic department at the Hebrew University, I believe his name was Kaufman, passed away. He was considered to be a world-class scholar in academic circles, 
And I remember the secular newspapers here took the Israeli community to task how few people showed up to the funeral. It was embarrassing. World-class scholar. Very interesting. That man lived here, made his career here. Probably a nice fellow. Chazoka, the Jew, where he was wrong, he was wrong. But a handful of people showed up for the funeral. Ramesha Feinstein, Zatzal, did not live here. He sat in a dinky little apartment on the east side of Manhattan in an area that was depressed and changing. But any Bentayra, any Jew in America that had a connection to Taylor Mitzvahs knew who Ramesha was. And his decisions and his chuvas affected the world, history, because he was part of the connection of the Messiahs from generation to generation, of leadership. That's what leadership is in our community. Not who gives the biggest donation to UJA, not who has the most clout politically, but somebody who the Eilam HaTeira, the Torah world, recognizes as a decisor and a leader of the community. Fascinating. If you also want to get a handle on that a little bit more, you listen to the stories they tell about Ramesha. One of the stories they told about him, verified, that uh, he got out of a car, somebody dropped him off, and fellow caught his finger when he slammed the door, Ramesh's finger in the door. He waited till the car drove away till he re reacted. He didn't react. Now, I don't know how he contained himself, but he did. That and more stories like that, when you listen carefully and look carefully, at our gedolim, our leadership, it's the stories of the small moments, the moments when they're not in the spotlight, not on stage, not being recorded, always recorded there, but not being specifically, particularly online, how they react. That the it's, to my mind, a, a fulfillment of, Posik says, Ein tzur kelokeno. There's no creator understood as also tzayar artist like the Rebbeinu Shlodim. A painting, if you stand, you need perspective. You have to step back. If you come close, you see the caked up strokes of the oil. Not very attractive. The Rebani Shalom inside, the closer you get, the more magnificent it is. The more we are going to understand in physics and biology and microbiology, the more we're going to see the Seder and the Yad Hashem. We're always in the middle. Yesterday's insight and revelation is already old hat. Science moves forward. Constantly. And the more we understand, the closer we get, we see more Seder and more Seder. What seemed to be chaos does, in fact, have some other dimension that we didn't anticipate of orderliness. The same thing is true. The Domus, the Drocha of emulating the Rebani Shlolem, a tzaddik, the closer you get, the more you're going to see that this person is not the just reacting to events. He's proactive. He has a game plan. 
He's part of a Meseris. He's part of Klai transmission from Sinai till today. Akobonim Ramesha has a tshuva. People wrote it from all around the world. And they asked, the tshuva, the shoyal asked, can you fulfill the mitzvah of Bika Cholim on the telephone? And then there's a discussion that takes place about the difference between doing it on the it's a mitzvah. Now there's technology. Is it a chesed to call somebody up? Yeah, that's, that's for sure. But do you fulfill the mitzvah of Bika? Why? Because Bika Cholim, your presence does something that your lack of presence cannot cannot fulfill. Part of which is that it affects you when you are in the presence of the patient and that affects your davening and then you daven better and more for that person. And the quality of your davening improved also accrues to the merit, the schus of the patient. So an interesting kind of a question. The Shoel, the one who's asking the question, quotes the Sefer Yikrim. The Sefer Yikrim, Kadmon, either a late Rishon or a very, very early Achron, just at the bridge. And Sefer Yikrim asks, Meshe Rabbeinu, he is from the Rebani Shlalem that the Jews have made the Egel. He does not immediately respond and break the Lukos. He waits till he comes down and sees and then breaks the Lukos. Says the Sefer Ikim that that teaches that seeing adds a dimension of internalization and emotionalization that it, you're missing without seeing it. The Ritziv says something very similar, and the Pasha is voracious. The Ritziv says that Vayar Hashem ki tov, the Rebbe Hashem saw that which he created was good. What does it mean? It means that the Rebbe Hashem implanted, embedded in vision, something that doesn't exist in the other senses, hearing, touch, taste, to that extent, is that it brings to action. It provokes action. You cannot not react when you see. Ramesha, in his chufa about the telephone, where the questioner asks and quotes this, this Sefer Ikim, Ramesha has no problem, he says, can't say that. Because Moshe Rabbeinu's nevuah is a splakaya me'ira. It's another level. It's total clarity. It's not viewing through an opaque glass. It's total transparency, total clarity. It's a moment that is equal to being there. There's no transition between him hearing from the Rebani Shalom on Sinai and then later seeing it. Often we say that seeing is believing. But that's not the, can't be the issue here because he heard it from God. He heard it from the Rebani Shalom. So, Ramesha says that that can't be the reason that he waited. And he says one possibility like the like the Svona, that somehow there was seeing that they had was singing and dancing around the eagle, added a dimension to it, and the it wasn't just the construction of the eagle that was the violation, and the there seems to be that says the Svona that there's a reality. Not seems to be there's a reality that when somebody does something but simcha, it becomes internalized. See them bring this again as a source that you do something but simcha over there, unfortunately, was a negative thing. 
But if you do the right thing, the simcha becomes internalized. Rav Meisha quotes that, though I, I honestly don't understand how you could differentiate if there was a sparkanya mira why he didn't see that it was the simcha too. But Rav Meisha does give a second reason. He said the psukim here, and then later on at the end of the Torah, says that the Rebbe Nishon, <coughs> the Pasek in Torah, Meisha Rebbeinu says, the luchus that I broke before Klal Yisrael, that you witnessed. It's a deal, Dafka, before Klal Yisrael, that you, in front of you, Klal Yisrael. They had to see it. For them, there would be a difference between hearing it or just or seeing it. If he would have broken it on Sinai, they would have heard about it, but they wouldn't have seen it. The Chsam Sefer that asks Akasha at the, in the beginning of Sefer Dvorim, Moshe Rabbeinu gives a list of the places where he gave Teichacho. And he gave Musa to Klai Yisrael. You did this here, uh, Chatzeros, Dei Zohov, Polo, Midbar Polo. He gives a whole, a whole list of all the stops and what happened in each place. So the Medrash asks, what do, I, what do I need all the geography for? Well, it's nice to know. If you're doing a doctorate, if you want to register at Kaufman, ex-Kaufman, the late Kaufman's courses in, uh, in Jewish history. But what's the point? The Medrash says, since he waited till he was very old, because the older a person is, the more credibility he has that he doesn't have an agenda. He's not angling for some kind of an advantage or maneuvering. He's closer to final exams. It's not midterms. There's a principle like that. It's an axiom that we posit that somebody closer to the end, has more. That's the upside. That's why he's waiting. But there's a downside. What's the downside? The downside is, well, maybe he's senile, maybe he's not with it anymore. He doesn't... Uh, maybe he lost it. So in order to rebut that possibility of incipient senility, what does he do? This I said here, this I said there. He gives you all the geography to show that he's with it and that he has all his, his acuity. That's the medrash. Says the Chsam Sefer, asks the Chsam Sefer, he doesn't understand the medrash. Because the Torah itself, the Psukim, testifies to the fact that Moshe was youthful even in his old age. And it seemed the way the Chsam Sefer is presenting it, that it was evident that he was youthful. So if he was, there couldn't be such a Havamina. There couldn't be such a, a possibility that he lost it. Says the Chsam Sefer, yeah, that's true, but we have a Machlekes, the Babli and the Yushalmi, on Bayas Rishon, first temple, the breaking in to the sea, breaking in, the Shiva Osa Betamus, or that happened that happened later. Medush Posik, in fact, says that the Tisha Yamayo says it happened on the ninth. Why? 
why don't we fast on the ninth? Because the, the we don't have we don't put consecutive Tanaisim on the Tzibu, we're going to have to fast Yud Zayin that in Bayashemi. And we're closer to Bayashemi. The Yushami says, Tesis brings, that it happened both times on Yud Zayin. Just they were confused about the dating. Some Sefer says, the way I understand the Chsam Sefer is that what does it mean they got confused about the dating? That the turmoil, the devastation, the suffering, the tragedies were, were so, so overwhelming that they lost the count. And it seems though that the Novi wears two hats. He wears the hat, he's a citizen, he's an Ezrach and a minion, he's, he's part of the populace. He also lost it. At the moment of truth that he's a Novi, he saw the Emes, everything. But the Rebbe Shalom said to him, put it down according to the mistake so that future generations will know how bad the suffering was. Continues the Chsam Sefer. If that's true, working from that premise, working with that, so then Chazal teaches that Moshe Rabbeinu witnessed all of the tzoros that Klai Yisrael would ever have out throughout history. Ad hayam ha'achron, ad hayom ha'achron, Chazal darshan. That means Moshe Rabbeinu witnessed first temple destruction, second temple destruction, the Kriminyaki, Inquisition, Halakha, everything. And we don't see that Moshe Rabbeinu got confused. So the Chesam Sefer says, in order, the Medrash, when the Medrash said, that there was no Havamina that he was senile, even though he was old, because he had that youthfulness. But you might think that since there would be a Novi in the future, Yemiyo, that would get confused of the Tzoros, so Meshe Rabbeinu's witnessing the Tzoros of Klai Yisrael throughout history, maybe he got confused because of that. Komash Malon, not, he didn't get confused. Ask the Ksam Sefer then, okay, but how come Meshe Rabbeinu did not get confused and Yemiyo did? Says the Chassam Sefer, Moshe Rabbeinu also witnessed the Geula, the redemption. He saw Bayes Shlishi. He saw the ultimate Gula. He saw Mashiach coming. He saw Beis David coming back. Yemiyoho knew that that's going to happen, but he didn't witness it. Okay. Now, there's a question here that I think we should ask. Wouldn't it have been a more straightforward answer for the Chassam Sefer to say, well, Moshe Rabbeinu only saw it in the Ad Yom Ad, he saw all the Tzoros. Yimio was living through it. Choshal If you live through it, maybe it's different. The Chassam Sefer does not say that. What does that teach us? That the Chesam Sefer holds that the Nevoah of Moshe Rabbeinu is the equivalent of living through it. There's no difference. And that's why he gives the terrets of the ultimate redemption. That would mean that Aspakal Yameira should encompass everything, including knowing that Kleidesel was besimcha unfortunately, tragically, when they made the eagle. So the reason Moshe Rabbeinu waited was that Klad Yisrael should see it. In fact, the Moshe Chochmah is not dealing with this question about why Klad Yisrael, why Moshe Rabbeinu waited. He just asks a question, why did Moshe Rabbeinu break the Luchas? What's the point in breaking the Luchas? 
answers the Moshe Chochmah. Of course, all these sources should be seen inside, but the Moshe Chochmah says, in order to traumatize Klad Yisrael, there's nothing more Kodosh holier in the world at the moment of the Luchas, the first Luchas, that were carved by the Rebbeinu Shalom, inscribed by the Rebbeinu Shalom, the letters there, miraculously, two sides. And Moshe Rabbeinu's lesson is that there's nothing that's a prerequisite for my interaction with the Rebbeinu Shalom in the Bria in this world that is a necessary requirement of the what the Halacha teaches me I should do and shouldn't do. But in my direct contact with the Rebbeinu Shalom, it only, sanctity is as the Rebbeinu Shalom awards it, re-awards it, re-awards it, and re-awards it. It is not self-perpetuating. What better way, what better pilcha, rebuttal to avoid a zora, to idolatry, is there than to break the holiest thing in the world, in the material world, the luchas, and say, okay, now we pick up the pieces and we go from here. We go from here and we go forward and we build luchas shniazdik, second luchas, Yigiyah, toil, sweat, and the joy, the joy that comes with it. Ben should give us all through this tough times. The Mendel Zatzal used to love to quote one, one famous football coach who used to say that when the going gets tough, the tough get going. Fellas, I'm talking to myself as well, very youthful. Can I hug? We're living in tough times, and the more we perspire here, and the more we roll on our tongues and savor the language of Chazal, we're tasting bits of Ruach HaKodesh, we're tasting that which gives us our connection to the Luchas, to Jewish history, to our Oasis, to our lettering, and it's only through schusim and the miracle of the cosmic computer in the, in the sky that we are here yet today and that Mirz Hashem will continue to be here for Deiris, Shem Yazor, Klad Yisrael, Am Yisrael to bring Kvod Shemayim down here.